I want to start with a tradition unlike any other, and that's television stations calling him Magic Johnson saying, hey, do you want to pour some jet fuel on the fucking Lakers? And he's like, yep. How many shows can I do? So let's run through some of this Lakers stuff, which is going to be news, and it's going to continue to be news throughout the playoffs, the draft, free agency. It's just not going away, so why don't I jump in as well? So Magic goes on a bunch of the ESPN shows, and his basic goal is, is one thing. When things go wrong with the Lakers, he wants Lakers fans to know that he would have done it differently and that none of this is on him. And in a weird way, I guess it isn't. But at the same time, he's still advising the team all the time. It's a very different different role. And I just think it's odd in general. Like, we're so numb to it because he's been doing it for such a long time. And yeah, he's got a big ego. If I were Magic Johnson in L.A., guess what? I'd have a massive ego, too. If there's somebody that's allowed to have a big ego, I think Magic Johnson is okay to do it. But that's also what drives a lot of this stuff. It's just very odd. And I can think of like a comp that doesn't make any sense because it'd be impossible to imagine it. But imagine if Larry Bird lived in the Boston area and every six months would go on ESPN and be like, I don't know why they took Romeo Langford. This guy sucks. Like, yeah, I don't know about this trade. Derek White, give up another first back-to-back years if the Celtics weren't playing well. Like, that would just be so weird. But we're just so used to it with Magic. We're like, oh, wait, he's doing this again? And he did it. And he did it big time. And he actually got a lot of stuff wrong. So he said that he got a call from uh, DeMar DeRozan's agent, that he would have brought in DeMar DeRozan. He would have done that deal. The Lakers would have brought him home. He wanted to come home. But it was LeBron's fault because Westbrook's there, which it is LeBron's fault that Westbrook is with the Lakers. So part of this is that Magic's telling you that he gets the call from the agent as if the agent, an NBA agent who has a client like DeMar DeRozan doesn't have a cell phone number for anyone that makes decisions with the Lakers. But that's also part of the sell job here, too. First of all, we know the Lakers had no cap space. The the most they could offer DeRozan was five point nine million, which was the taxpayers mid-level, which was not going to happen because DeRozan was going to get over 20 million. And by the way, he ended up signing over uh, a three year deal with the Bulls, 82 million to 85 million with some of the bonuses or incentives. So. That wasn't going to work, right? I'm just throwing it out there so that we understand. And by the way, with DeRozan, let's not have, because he's been awesome this year. He's Most of us thought that deal didn't make any sense. Three years, $82 million for someone that much older. Not many of us like that deal. So now everybody's going back being like, oh, we should have brought in DeRozan. And by the way, there's still years left on the deal. It's kind of that weird thing that will happen in baseball sometimes where a guy gets like a six-year deal that all of us think is terrible and he goes three for four on opening day. People are like, well, I thought this was a bad deal. And you're like, you know, we got like six years to go on this one, guys. Let's see how it goes. But so far, DeRozan has proven everybody wrong. And the sign and trade that the Bulls made with San Antonio wasn't exactly like a, a, a war chest of assets. It was Thaddeus Young, a first couple seconds. So maybe the Lakers could have done that. Uh, not impossible, certainly, if they wanted to include Kuzma in some kind of deal. But then we've got to ask ourselves, did the Spurs want Kuzma? Kuzma's money isn't crazy. As soon as he signed his contract, they're like, actually, you're going to get traded now because it's a very tradable contract. Kuzma on his best days is a really good player. On his worst days, you're not quite sure how he fits in. So maybe San Antonio would have done some sort of sign and trade with DeRozan. Um, the picks part of this is pretty light, though, for the Lakers because we understand all the picks they include in the Anthony Davis deal. So let's say that's a possibility. The part where Magic continues on, he's, <laughs> he he was like, yeah, but I also would have done the Buddy Heald deal. We're like, well, who the fuck were you trading for Buddy Heald if you were doing a sign and trade with DeRozan? And then he said he would have kept Caruso and Contavious Caldwell Pope. You're like, well, wait, you can't do these things. At that point, they'd been hard capped um, with the, the AD and LeBron deals and then just sort of magically keeping everybody and some DeRozan extension that would have been in the 20s. So none of that made any sense. And he had no problem just saying all the stuff that would have happened. Uh, But this isn't new. This isn't new. And if I'm a Lakers fan, I I wonder if you go, I think he thinks that people will go, and maybe a lot of Lakers fans do. They're like, yeah, he's right. We could have had DeRozan. Like, do you see what Magic said? Man, we screwed this up. Too bad Magic isn't in charge again. And you're like, yeah, but the guy that just said he would have done all these things, like, I think he just was talking. You know, I don't know that it's that he doesn't understand what some of the rules are. That seems to be a little aggressive, but I don't I, I don't know. Like, I, I checked with a cap guy, too. I'm like, wait, none of this makes any sense. He's like, collectively, no, it doesn't. It doesn't make any sense. All right, so we keep it moving because the Lakers also are going to have some other decisions. And to add to the magic conversation to this, do you remember what he was saying when the Lakers did get Russell Westbrook? Let's go over some of the tweets. With Westbrook joining LeBron and AD, the Lakers now have their version of the big three. All we need now is a couple shooters would be tough to beat. Actually, I'll uh, agree with that part of it. Um, also in July of last year, Russell Westbrook is the most electric player in the NBA today and Staples Center will be on fire next season. 
well, on fire may actually be correct for a different reason. Let's look at the rest of the roster, at least the pieces that we can talk about here. Anthony Davis trades. I still like Anthony Davis. I feel like less and less people agree with me on that one. If you want to say that he's inconsistent, he's hurt all the time, he's soft, he doesn't quite have that alpha edge, I'll agree with you on all those things. Um, but the best the best case scenario for the Lakers is to get Anthony Davis back, which I don't think at his age is impossible if he figures out the right training regimen. Or maybe he'll be hurt the rest the rest of his days and, and it'll be a huge disappointment and a, and a career unfulfilled and all of those things, all right? Uh, LeBron doesn't win a title without him, and we know that AD didn't do anything down in New Orleans without a guy like LeBron, all right? So they needed each other. Everybody needs somebody in the NBA. But if you're thinking of Anthony Davis trades, it's a little bit more complicated because of the LeBron factor, right? You can't just trade Anthony Davis for picks to recoup some of the picks you sent to New Orleans or young players coming back. LeBron's not interested in any of those things. He's not. So that limits kind of what you're able to do. There's one very consistent rule that can be broken at times, but it's fairly consistent in the NBA that teams, when they have established players, do not like to trade their established players for other established players that may be dealing with some sort of problem. When Paul George was available to everyone, the Pacers back then when he wanted out of Indiana, they called everyone in the league. I talked to multiple teams about it, and they were like, yeah, you know, Paul George being offered everybody here because they know that they're screwed, and he's telling everybody he's out of there that he wants to play for the Lakers, and, you know, it's it's not going to happen. And a couple of the trades that I heard about, I remember talking to one team in particular where I was like, well, he, Paul George is better than the guys that you'd be sending out. And they go, yeah, yeah, but here's the thing is we're adding Paul George to our crew that's already established. We are not trading our non-problems that are established for a new problem that isn't established with us. And who knows what Paul George is going to do because that guy changed his mind like three or four times within a few months. Um, let's be fair, maybe a year and a half, right? So if you're saying Anthony Davis isn't healthy, LeBron wants to do something else, where's the trade where you're trading him for established pieces that are coming back so the other team is restarting what they're doing with somebody that has injury concerns? So yes, there could be a third team where the picks go to the other team, Davis goes to one, and then some established guys go somewhere else. But those trades kind of don't really happen that much. Again, not impossible. Impossible is not a word that we like to use in the NBA when we talk about trades. And that segues perfectly into Russell Westbrook. Because at $47 million and one year left, there's some stuff you could do. But it's really difficult because you're probably adding an asset on top of everything else to send Russell Westbrook out. So what... What do you have that's ready to compete and who's established that exists that a team is willing to trade? Now, I think LeBron and the crew wanted to do the John Wall deal because they felt like just getting Westbrook out of here is an improvement. And I would agree with that part. But again, it's still their fault he was there in the first place. But that's the other problem with the Westbrook trade is it's not just that you're trading this guy with an incredible individual resume, right? You're trading somebody who looks in the mirror and still sees a superstar. And his stubbornness is what has made him such a, product, a productive player who will one day be in the Hall of Fame. But if you have a young team, and Orlando always gets brought up all the time, right? Like, think of the stale teams. Hell, we could even throw Houston back in this. OKC would be part of this, too, because some people wonder, like, would Presti, if you threw in a pick in 2027, would he be willing to do this? Would he figure out some way like, hey, bring Westbrook back? Westbrook with a bunch of young players as you're actually like on year two or three of your rebuild doesn't make a lot of sense either. To have all of your young players that are lottery picks watching him run up and down the court and chuck it up 20 times, is that really what a lot of teams will want that feel like, yeah, we might not be any good, but do we want to disrupt whatever development we hope to build here with somebody like Westbrook? So that complicates that as well. It's going to get weird, all right? And LeBron has already hinted at some of the stuff where he said on the shop he wanted to play with Steph Curry. He said that he wanted to play with Luka. This is, I imagine, some version of him presenting leverage to the Lakers because LeBron has consistently done this at every stop. He wants to put pressure on ownership and management. He doesn't think that anybody will ever act to the to the limits of, of their abilities, right? To the, the absolute ceiling, pushing it, being like, we need to win, we need to win. And I disagree with this, by the way. I think teams all want to win. But he feels like unless there is a threat of him deciding to do something, that teams never... Um, the owners will not be as all in unless they feel threatened. And that's why he hinted at the Steph stuff, which, you know, I, I didn't make a ton of sense. The Doncic part, it's like, wait, do I want to bring this guy in? I know Windhorse had a thing about the Clippers. Look, when LeBron tried to recruit Kawhi to come as a free agent, Kawhi wasn't really vibing with LeBron whatsoever and didn't want to go with him and decided to do his own thing. And the other thing, when you start talking about certain players that you build around and say, okay, I'm going to dump all of these draft picks in the future 
because I want to bring in players now to support our current guy. If LeBron's in his early 30s, you can kind of understand that. But even with LeBron, there's some kind of risk. You know, there's a version of this Clippers thing, which I completely understand and everybody would do getting Kawhi and Paul George. But down the road, they may look at this going, look at these unprotected picks and what a disaster this ended up being. That could happen to them. When you look at Milwaukee trading for Drew Holiday, that one makes a little bit more sense because I think you get the feeling that Giannis is a more content player. And that's also another weird topic that's entirely different. But we have a lot of the American players that seem to get really unhappy very quickly where it feels like some of the foreign players are better bets to build around because you feel like there's less of a threat of them deciding they want to bounce. I mean, look at the names and look at the history of the players of the last decade that have forced their way out. A lot of the foreign guys seem to be a lot more happier about it. So I don't even know what that means. But there's a there's a summary on all of this, right, with LeBron James, and it's simple. As you get a little bit older, he's going to make a push here for the scoring title, and he sat out games. I'm a little surprised by this because he's going to end up getting crushed by it. And I think a lot of times that they they calculate their moves, they try to do things that gets him the least amount of criticism. And in a way, him sitting out games where they were still eligible for the play-in, but now eliminated. And now he's going to push for the scoring title, which he's now behind Embiid as Embiid's continue to be on this tear for the MVP. He's going to end up getting crushed for this stuff if he's playing specifically and loading up and trying to get points at the end of the season. Like he's going to get crushed, but maybe he's only going to get cr- crushed by the people that are already crushing him. But it's a lot like a relationship. And unfortunately, with LeBron and the Lakers, this is getting towards the end of the relationship. We're in the beginning of a relationship. All the weird stuff is still kind of cute because you're so excited. But at the end of it, you get sick of it really quickly. And that's going to be the standoff between player and franchise. <laughs> 